Hello and welcome to the Native Food for Life online. If you or someone you care about has type 2 diabetes, um, gestational diabetes, or prediabetes, you've come to the right place. Over the next six weeks, we'll be giving you the most up-to-date information on how to get off the diabetes highway. Now, there's handouts for each week. They're available on a tab in the same uh, area of the Special Diabetes Program where you found this video. And so look for that. Or if you email me at darylin.berryman2 at gtbindians.com, I can send you that resources directly. If you um, have any lab tests or physical exams, physical exam results, uh, like measurements of your body mass or your weight, any A1C um, measurements. Um, or if you have access to your health care provider um, and you've had a recent visit, find out your current measurements for like your blood pressure and your fasting blood sugar, any hemoglobin A1C and lipids, also called cholesterol panels. Um, and it's just interesting to see if you have that now and then you can uh, take those same tests after this class to see um, what those measurements have done with using this program. And so there is also a link to a short questionnaire. And if you also look on this tab into the same area, the special diabetes tab, it'll say the NFFLO survey. Please fill out that survey and then where it says instructor, please put Darlin Berryman so that our uh, program gets credit for you viewing this video and filling out that survey. If you view all of the videos and you fill out the three surveys at the beginning, the middle, and the end, you'll receive a Native Food for Life measuring cup and apron. So be sure you put my name as the instructor, Darylin Berryman, so we can get credit and get you your prize. All right, next we're going to start the lesson. It's a pre-recorded video and we're going to use the chat during the video if we have any questions. Um, if you're watching this as the pre-recorded video, you can always email me at uh, darylin.berryman2 at gtbindians.com and for any questions. We have a registered dietitian uh, with our class so we can answer questions live or if you think of them during the week and uh, you want to email me or you just want to do it separately, feel free please to email. All right, so here is our video and uh, we can chat our questions in or save your questions for last or email them to me. Thank you so much. Welcome to Native Food for Life. It is my honor to present this program in partnership with the Physicians Committee. My name is Whitney Brooks. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. I'm from the Seneca Nation, uh, which is located in what is now called Western New York. So I'm really excited to share this program with you because the information that we cover has been so beneficial to me and I hope that you and your communities will receive just as much benefit as I have. So a little bit about me. I initially got into plant-based eating because I was concerned about my appearance. I had um, acne prone skin well into adulthood and it was really frustrating because I tried literally everything else except for plant-based eating. And when I finally did, I was 26 years old and it was a revelation because I could not believe how quickly it worked to heal the inflammation that I was experiencing on my skin. Little did I know that the, um, the inflammation that was probably already happening in my body was also being helped. There's never been a better time to start shifting our eating patterns to support our overall health. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting aftermath, it is so important that we do whatever we can to support our overall health. Welcome to lesson one, the power to heal diabetes with Native Food for Life. This program will help you learn about the foods that have the power to prevent and treat type two diabetes. In this program, we will learn a lot. We're probably gonna laugh a little bit. Uh, we're gonna cook some new things and we're gonna eat some delicious food. So all together, we're gonna to discover the truth about how food really is medicine. Native Food for Life is different 
because we focus on treating the root causes of diabetes and not just treating the symptoms. You can expect each week in this program to learn how to eat to protect and heal your body. We can learn a new skill or improve an existing cooking skill. And then we're going to watch a food demonstration and learn a new recipe to try at home. Now it's time to settle in and watch a mini documentary featuring indigenous actor Graham Greene, who starred in a movie you may have heard of called Dances with Wolves. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Graham Greene. I would like to speak to you as someone who has seen the devastating effects of diabetes. For thousands of years, diabetes was rare, perhaps non-existent among our people. Today, one in five Native American adults has diabetes, and our teenagers are the fastest growing group being diagnosed. This epidemic has touched all our lives. It has certainly touched mine. I watched an aunt die from the slow, painful effects of diabetes. And just recently, my youngest brother was diagnosed with type 2. We have rediscovered that food and a healthy diet can not only help us prevent diabetes. For those who have type 2 diabetes, healthy foods can help turn it around. For some, the result is nothing short of miraculous. This program is the beginning of a new journey. It is a direction that can literally change your life. You will meet people whose lives have been transformed. You will also meet researchers whose research has shown that the answer to diabetes prevention may lie in our age-old food traditions. That's right. Food is the medicine that will help us reclaim our health. And we can put this knowledge into action for ourselves, our children, and generations to come. Thank you. I come from North Dakota. I'm from the Mandan Hidatsa and Arikara Nation. We have an epidemic of diabetes on our reservation. Um, it's rare to go into a room with five people and less than three not have diabetes. The first thing I noticed was I was thirsty all the time. Then I was really lethargic. I couldn't get enough sleep. I couldn't rest enough. My mom was always tired. She I don't know. She just laid in bed all day. We did nothing. I would just go outside by myself. And she would just be sleeping all day. It alarmed me. And I went to the doctor and they said, your blood sugar is really high. Are you diabetic? And I'm like, no, I'm only 23. I'm only 23. How could I be, you know? And then um, I never went back because I was offended. How dare you ask me if I'm diabetic? Things are not going in the right direction at all. If you look at the latest figures, one in three children born since the year 2000 is eventually going to develop this disease if things don't change. We have to think about this disease differently. We have to find something better than just a new screening test or a new kind of prescription. I was 288 pounds. I noticed that my joints hurt. It was hard for me to get around. I sweated very easily. It was a chore just to get up and go help clean around the house or to go outside and get wood. It was a chore. Socializing with people was harder. More or less, I didn't care about what people thought. Like physically of me, but emotionally, and people didn't care emotionally about how I felt. Nobody wanted to socialize with me. When Jensen was heavy, he didn't really express how he felt, or you could just see it on the way 
his attitude over time he just got quiet so I would be like let's just go take a walk or you want to go with me I'm going somewhere it worried me that I wasn't an, that I wasn't healthy that I just thought it was normal I just thought it was normal to be overweight that everybody else just gets chubby everybody just gets chubby I just thought that I started, you know, coming down with the sugar diabetes and after I got that, you new know, things increased to other symptoms like high blood pressure and high cholesterol and sleep apnea. That was one of the uh, one of the, my main um, serious illness that I had. Well, they told me that I don't, you know, if I don't control my my diabetes, you know, I would uh, eventually go blind, and um, other like heart heart problems and you know hearing problems, and um, they told me that I would lose all my teeth too, and I didn't want that to happen. It was kind of uh, hard for me to accept, you know, that I had sugar diabetes. I was on 22 different medications. My mom was very sick when I was little. I thought she was dying. When she got up, um, I would have to make the bed because she was, she had to go do something else, like go take her medicine. And then I would have to count her pills, just make sure that she's on daily what she's doing. I would just say, are you okay? Do you need anything? I would kind of take care of her. Um, it was, I guess, a lot of work for a little child. I was afraid of her going away, dying, and I wouldn't have anyone to take care of me. Why is this happening? Why are so many people struggling with obesity or with type 2 diabetes? Is it a gene or is it something environmental? We really wanted to do something about this. So with the support of the National Institutes of Health, we began a research study. And it was based on the observation that if you look at the countries where there's not much diabetes and not much obesity, they all have one thing in common, which is that their diets are predominantly plant-based, like rice in Japan, for example. So we had a large group of people who had diabetes, and we asked them to follow a completely plant-based diet. Beans and grains and vegetables and fruits, abundant quantities. They weren't counting calories and eating tiny little portions, but Everything they were eating was healthy and plant-based, and the results were spectacular. People lost weight, their blood sugars came down, their cholesterols came down, their need for medicine came down. In some cases, they got off their medicines completely. And when the results came out, I was asked to do an interview on a Native American radio program, and I was describing the health power of grains and beans and vegetables against diabetes. A woman called into the show, and she said, the foods you're using are almost identical to a Native American tradition called the Three Sisters. And these traditional foods kept her ancestors healthy generation after generation after generation. And I got totally excited about this. How could these simple, very simple basic foods have so much health power? Traditional foods uh, was basically uh, bean, squash, and corn in those, the old days when the people consumed that, they were slimmer, they were healthier. Many uh, changes have come about due to white man's influence. People are consuming a lot of ready-made foods, processed foods, and uh, fast foods. Therefore, we see uh, an increase in diabetes and obesity and other um, diseases. When I was young, we moved around a lot. So the food choices changed. Everything was processed. Everything was packaged. I lost my cravings for vegetables and the love I had for fresh tomatoes, for carrots, for cucumbers, even strawberries. For myself, it's, a, it's kind of a short story. When I was growing up, I was always starving. I was always hungry because uh, we were being raised with a big family. 
but after you go to school, you find a job, and you have more money, and you tend to spend more money on food. I started noticing that I was getting getting really big, and people started telling me. I didn't really um, mind, you know, looking like that until it started affecting my, my, my health. Traditionally, people ate very, very simple foods, things that came from the earth, vegetables, fruits, simple foods. But those foods kept people strong. I contacted Betty Delro from the Navajo Nation because I wanted to learn more about these healthy Native American traditions. And I also wanted to see if the research that we had been doing would be meaningful as well. So I went to Arizona, and Betty and her team showed me all about medicinal plants and ways of preparing traditional foods. We decided to set up a series of classes, a program that could allow people who had diabetes to learn to make healthy traditional foods and to see if that could help them. We didn't really know what to expect. Who knew if people would come to our classes, if they would keep coming, if they would like the food, if they would be able to find these foods in their communities. It was really an experiment. We had some great partners. We worked with the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque and the Institute for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. And we worked especially closely with the Navajo Nation Special Diabetes Project. And we had two great Native American chefs working with us who developed some wonderful recipes. They were able to demonstrate that you could pull together these dishes that were affordable and convenient, and most importantly, that they tasted great. And people came to our classes, and they kept coming back, and they raved about the foods. The turning point, the, the one thing that got me over the cliff to say, I don't want to be like this anymore, is I didn't want my daughter to see her mom with no legs. I didn't want my daughter to have the burden of pushing me in a wheelchair. I didn't want my daughter to be burdened with, Mom, did you take your insulin? Mom, did you take your metformin? I didn't want her to worry about that. I didn't want her to be in that situation where she would have to worry whether her mom's going to be here tomorrow or not. Dr. Barnard. <laughs> um, Lois Frank, Carolyn Trapp, Food for Life class. It just changed my life. I didn't even know what a radish tastes like. I didn't know star fruit. I didn't know you could make a taco taste so good. I didn't know you can blend these vegetables, these beans, just vegetarian items. I didn't know you could blend these items together and make them taste so good. And, and it satiated you, it fulfilled you. And it was also, fun. Before Dr. Barnard's class, I thought there was kidney beans, pinto beans, now there's garbanzo beans, azuki beans, mung beans, all kinds of beans, and you can sprout any kind of bean. Also, juicing, that's really fun. Flavors, the colors, the smells, the way it feels, after, after you ingest it, you don't feel heavy, you don't feel tired. In fact, after you have a glass of juice, it's not hard to go out for a walk. It's not hard to go do some layups with the daughter. <laughs> That's the best part about the, being vegan, I guess, is um, how it makes you feel after you ingest the food. These foods are nourishing. They give the body what you need, but they also have a lot of fiber to fill you up, a lot of vitamins to keep you healthy. They don't have a lot of fat to pad your, your fat stores. They don't have the things that will cause the insulin resistance that leads to the diabetes that we see. They don't have any of that. My dad sat us all down as a family and he pretty much said that we were gonna change our life. 
And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm not gonna change my life over food. I love food, food's my best friend. <laughs> and he was just smiling and I was like, I'm serious, I'm not gonna stop eating meat, are you crazy? That's my protein. And he just smiled and he was like, no, I'm pretty sure you could get other protein out there, healthier protein. And he's like, do you know what vegan is? And I was like, no. He's like, well, vegan is just when you have, you eat nothing with the face. No face products, nothing. And I was like shocked. I was like dairy, my milk, my cheese, my eggs. What really made me change was my weight. I noticed that I just weighed too much. I was like almost 300 pounds. I was 12 pounds away from being 300 pounds. The first 21 days is like the hardest for me in my life. I swear it was so hard. I thought about giving up. The first three days I thought like, oh, let me just go back to the store and go grab some water burger or some quick food. And we didn't. I stopped eating meat and just continue with my vegetables and fruits and just downsizing my portion of the plate that, you know, that I was eating. I used to weigh 235 pounds and I noticed that I started losing like a, a half a pound, one pound, and my recent weight was 200 pounds, so I'm still going down. My doctor took me off or cut back on some medications and she took away like gluberite, which I was taking. She took that away and cut down on, on my metformin. My high blood pressure pill was also cut back. And my recent cholesterol count is you know, pretty good, pretty normal. I got myself off the sleep apnea machine, which I was using. I, I hardly use that anymore. I feel really good that my numbers are going down and then I sleep well, I eat well, and, and I'm not stressed out all the time. I'm not too worried about my health. Food is not just calories. Foods act like medicines. Foods really do bring cholesterol levels down. Foods really do help you to lose weight. They really do bring blood sugars down. They can replace, in many cases, what medicines are doing. So when a person embraces a plant-based diet, they really do get the power to heal. Would you like this big old garlic? You are what you eat, and that's what really changed me. I lost about 80 pounds, give or take. <laughs> I lost my weight quick enough to make me feel good about myself. I noticed that my knee doesn't hurt. I can run five miles. I can hike. I don't get heartburn no more. My complexion's better. I personally think being vegan <laughs> is a spiritual thing. Being healthy, being one with your food. You know, Mother Earth grew that plant so that I could en enjoy it. This is our Mother Earth. That's where food comes from, healthy food. And I do know that there's a difference between being physically fit and being vegan fit. <laughs> Jensen is an inspiration to everyone. Um, you know, it's the day that you see your kid walk in and he has this big smile on his face that you haven't seen in years. And he's holding a pair of pants and he says, you know, I've had these pair of pants for three years and I can fit into them. He's so positive about life. He looks so good and he's so happy now. Everybody sees it and everybody feels it. And that's Jensen. 
And he wasn't that before, but he's that now. That was the gift that I gave back to Jensen. And when you give that gift to your child, it's the best feeling a parent can ever feel. My daughter, she would go have some fun by herself. She would ask me to do things. She would ask me to go play, but I was like, oh, I can't do it, I just can't. And that would break her heart. Now, I don't feel like that. And I'm like, hey, Ashley, let's go to the museum. Or, hey, Ashley, let's go um, play some basketball. Any chance she can see mommy going out there, she's like, all right, let's go do it. And then we end up having a blast. Since my mom's been, she changed her diet, we, we've been playing basketball or sometimes I would go on a run, she'll kind of speed walk as fast as she can and push herself and I'm really happy that she does that because she has more time for me. I'm proud of her for making this change in your life and actually caring about your diet and what you're putting in your body. When people come to my house, they're like, wow. At first they're like, oh, should I bring my own food? But when you really learn to cook and you love what you're doing, then pretty soon, you know, the presentation and the colors are popping. And people are like, oh, I want to try that. And so before you know it, they're asking for the recipe. And so you're actually t turning somebody's life also. It just takes one person to change your life. That's what it took for me. And hopefully that's what it's gonna take for my daughter. The point that I'm proud of in my life is that I can run or jog five miles up into the hills and I can still do push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups at my age. One of the main reasons why I'm doing this is, you know, to, you know, pass my experience to everybody that we need to stay on this diet, keep with it, and to avoid, you know, eating the wrong kind of food. I most proud of myself because I'm vegan. I'm young, I'm healthy to go outside to enjoy this beautiful weather, to feel good, to smile, I'm confident. <laughs> the thing I am most proud of, in all honesty, is my future. I didn't really have one. Not without diabetes, anyway. I didn't have a future without it. Now, I do. And how I did that was because of taking all the tools that I learned from the first day I walked into the doctor's office, Dr. Barnard's class, reading his books, inspiring my daughter, and just wanting that future, free from diabetes. Not just for myself, but I want my whole, I want my grandchildren to be di free of diabetes. I don't even want them to even know the word. I don't even want them to know it existed.
Now it's time to check our understanding. Here are some important questions to answer to make sure that we understand key topics. The answer will be shown after a short pause. Remember, this is no pressure. The answer will be shown after the question. Question one. Eating a plant-based or whole foods way of eating is A, complicated and costly, or B, simple and encourages healthy families and communities? The answer is B. Once we know what to eat to heal our bodies, plant-based eating can be simple. Question two. A common symptom of diabetes is thirst. Is that true or false? The answer is true. One of the common symptoms of diabetes is having excessive thirst. Question three. It is normal to become overweight and get diabetes as we get older. Is this true or false? The answer is false. We don't have to get overweight and develop diabetes. Question four. A plant-based or vegan diet can manage and even reverse chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity, and high blood pressure. True or false? The answer is true. We can manage these chronic diseases with diet. Question five. Before the Europeans came to this continent with dietary patterns centered around domestic livestock, our ancestors often died young of diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic diseases. Is that true or false? This one is most definitely false, as native people weren't struggling with these diseases until after colonization. Question six. Plant-based diets are suitable for A, men, B, women, C, children, D, elders, or E, all of the above. The answer is E, all of the above. Everyone can benefit from plant-based diets. Question seven. If I eat a plant-based diet, I should take a supplement or vitamin that includes A, cholesterol, B, vitamin A, C, vitamin B12, D, calcium. The answer is C, vitamin B12. It's the only supplement that we really need to take when on completely plant-based diets. We don't have any dietary need for cholesterol, and calcium is one of the most abundant minerals in our diets. Hi, I'm Dr. Carolyn Trapp. I'm a nurse practitioner with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and I'm really glad to join you as part of this wonderful program today. You have heard about all of the benefits of eating plant-based meals, but are there any risks? Almost always the benefits of diet change far outweigh any risks. However, if you take certain medications such as insulin or pills that can cause low blood sugar for diabetes, or if you take blood pressure pills, or if you take a blood thinner called warfarin or Coumadin, this little presentation is for you. The good news is that with better eating, you may need less medication, but how will you know when you're taking too much? This chart shows you some of the symptoms of low blood sugar. And for people with diabetes who take insulin or some of the pills for diabetes that have as a side effect that they can cause low sugar, these are the symptoms to watch out for. Shaking or fast heartbeat, sweating, weakness or fatigue, feeling anxious, feeling hungry, getting a headache, feeling dizzy, or being irritable, grouchy. Any of these may be a sign that your blood sugar is too low. 
And these symptoms tend to come on pretty quickly. Uh, one minute you feel fine, the next minute you just don't feel right. Some people get all of these symptoms. Some people just get one or two. It's most likely to occur if you've gone four or five hours since you've had anything to eat. And even if you've never had low blood sugar before, if you are taking either of these two kinds of medications, insulin or certain pills, your blood sugar can get too low. And that number varies for different people. Usually we say below 70 is too low, but for some people below 80 or 90 or even 100 is too low. Your healthcare professional should be able to help you with knowing what number is too low for you. What do you do about it? First of all, get something to eat or drink, a glass of juice, some regular pop, not diet pop, um, or some glucose tablets are all good treatments for low blood sugar. If this happens more than once in a week, or if you have a really bad low blood sugar where you feel like you're gonna pass out, get in touch with your healthcare professional right away to adjust your diabetes medications. If you take blood pressure pills, here's what you need to know. If you feel dizzy or lightheaded or are sick to your stomach or have blurred vision, if you're dehydrated or really, really thirsty, if you're feeling super tired or if you faint, any of these can be signs that your blood pressure medication is now too strong for you. If you have any of these symptoms, sit down or lie down and call your healthcare provider or have someone call for you. And if your symptoms are serious, call 911. If you take a blood thinner, a medication called warfarin or Coumadin, you are usually required to have a blood test once a month. With a diet change, you may need an INR test done more often, such as twice a month for a short time. If you take warfarin or Coumadin, let your healthcare provider know you are changing to a plant-based diet. It's good news. Many people find they need less medicine with a plant-based diet. However, we don't recommend making any changes to your medications without talking to your healthcare provider first. Be safe, check in with any questions or concerns. Next up, I have some important information for everyone. When you start eating more plant-based meals, you're gonna find you're gonna be spending some time in the kitchen. Now it won't be on the end of the meal where you're cleaning up all of these greasy, dishes and pans that had meat and oil, but it might be more time on the front end as you're chopping up all of those vegetables that go into these great dishes. So you've already met Whitney Brooks, but I wanna bring her back now to talk to you about kitchen knife skills. Whitney is enrolled Seneca Turtle Clan, and she lives on the Cattaraugus Territory in Western New York. She recently graduated from DeUville College Graduate Dietetics Program and is board certified as a registered dietitian nutritionist. She has been plant-based since 2016. Whitney loves to cook and garden and plans to incorporate native seeds and plants into her future practice. Here's Whitney to show you how to save your fingers and quickly and safely use your kitchen knives. Hello again, welcome to my home kitchen. Now it's time for our weekly cooking skills tutorial. This week we're going to cover some basic knife skills. So let's get started. Let's start with cutting boards. This is my regular standard cutting board. It does have some grip on the bottom so that when I put it on the counter it doesn't slide around too much. If you don't have a cutting board with built-in grips and you just have a standard wooden board, that slides all over your countertop. What you can do for that is grab some paper towels or you can use a kitchen towel, whatever you have on hand. You get them damp, squeeze the water out, and now that it's nice and damp, 
you can place your paper towel or kitchen towel right underneath the cutting board. And then once you put your cutting board on top of it, it is much more secure. Okay, let's talk knives. I have a standard chef knife here. It's pretty big. And then for my smaller jobs, for smaller things, I just have a basic paring knife. It just has a plastic handle. Um, you don't need anything fancy at all. Uh, the most important thing about your kitchen knives is that you keep them sharp. Sharp knives are actually a lot safer to use because they'll cut through whatever you're trying to cut without slipping or meeting resistance. So when you're ready to cut, you're gonna have your rinsed piece of produce or whatever you intend to cut. You're gonna have your knife handy nearby. So with this, I'm going to have my fingers wrapped around. I'm not gonna grip it like this. This is one of the most unstable ways you can hold. As you can see, your wrist can turn either way. So the proper way to hold a knife is have your fingers on the handle and your thumb. Your thumb and your index finger are going to grip the knife up here. So it's much more stable. I have much more control over what I'm doing with the knife. So just kind of like that. So now, so I just have a basic summer squash here. So in order to cut this safely, I'm just gonna cut off the ends, nice and easy. And then I'm just gonna cut off this end. Cuts like butter with a sharp knife. Okay, now I'm ready to dice up this squash. If you notice, it can roll a little bit here. So my goal is to try to create a flat surface so that I can cube this up. So one thing to note is that my fingers on the, on the piece of produce, I don't want them laying flat ever when I'm cutting on the cutting board. As you can see, it could be a bad situation. So in order to remedy that, I'm just going to make sure that my fingers, my fingertips are always facing up and down. So if you notice, if my fingers are always like this, the knife is never gonna hit a finger or a nail. So with that in mind, I'm going to very carefully press the swash down and I'm gonna cut it right down the middle. Nice and easy. So now I have a nice flat, sturdy place to put this squash. So now I have a nice, flat, even squash. So now I can easily dice this up to however I want. And now it's very easy to cut. Now I have four even cuts and now I can dice. Okay, next let's try an onion. So there's several different ways to cut an onion, but this is my favorite way. So I'm gonna take my knife, I'm gonna be careful to hold my onion with my fingertips going straight up and down, and I'm just gonna cut off the top, which is this part here, and I'm gonna leave the roots intact. So I'm gonna hold it very carefully and just cut off the top, nice and easy. So now I can just discard this. I have my onion. Now I have a nice, stable, non-rolling onion. So then, root end up, put it on this flat side, and I'm gonna cut it right in half. Now I have two separate halves with the roots still intact. Now, the half that I wanna use, I am free to peel it. Look how nice that looks. Nice red onion. So I'm gonna clear my board here. So if you notice, if I cut it this way, I'm gonna have big long strips, but I'd like more of a dice for this. So I'm going to be very careful and I'm going to take my knife and cut into the onion towards the center, making sure that my fingers aren't in the path. So now I can simply do a nice easy dice and you have nice little bite sized pieces to use. Remember, your knives are very sharp, so you're gonna use extreme caution when moving them around your kitchen. When we wash our knives, always make sure to wash them separately and away from other dishes, uh, just so you don't submerge it and forget about it and reach in and accidentally cut yourself. Okay, just to recap. When we're preparing our produce for cooking for whatever recipe we want to use, we want to make sure that when we're cutting with our sharp kitchen knives, that everything is as stable as we can possibly make it. From the cutting board, which we don't want sliding around, we want to make sure it's secure on the countertop so that we have a nice stable surface to cut on, all the way to when we're processing our various produce. 
I always want to try to cut it so that we can make it as flat and stable as possible so that it doesn't roll. And don't forget, don't forget that even your grip on your knife should be as stable as possible. And that remember to pinch it up at the top like this and have your fingers down here for additional support so that it's not if rolling around like this. So just to recap, when we're cutting, don't forget to make your fingers into a claw so that your fingers are up and down. Since we've seen a little more about using our kitchen knives safely, now we can prepare what we want with a little more confidence. This concludes our first cooking skills tutorial. See you next time. Now it's time for the blue corn and squash oatmeal recipe demonstration featuring Shanri Begay. Shanri Begay is a health educator for Native Americans for Community Actions Lasting Indigenous Family Enrichment Program in Flagstaff, Arizona. Hailing from the Diné and Tohono O'odham Nations, Shanri is passionate about promoting health and the outdoors in Native communities. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Science and a minor in American Indian Health Studies from the Northern Arizona University. Hi, today I'm going to teach you how to make blue corn and squash oatmeal. This is a really filling and nutritious breakfast that will keep you feeling energized throughout the day. It also incorporates traditional foods in a fun and tasty way. So our first ingredient is butternut squash. I chose butternut squash because it's creamy and has a slightly sweet taste. Um, our next ingredient is blue cornmeal. Blue cornmeal is from blue corn, which is traditionally farmed by the Hopi, and it's a variety of corn that is more nutritious and more, has more protein content than white or yellow corn. Our next ingredient is regular oats. Oats are really filling, really high in fiber. Our next ingredient is raisins, and these are optional. I like to just add some raisins um, for a little sweetness. I don't add sugar to my oatmeal, so I try and get it from fruit. And our last ingredient is also optional, chia seeds. And they're just these little tiny seeds that add healthy fats. To get started, we're going to first cut up our butternut squash. Start by cutting the top and bottom off for a more stable base. I like to cut it into smaller parts for easier peeling. Peel the squash by using a potato peeler. You can actually buy frozen cubed squash or just cut a small amount from a raw squash since this recipe only calls for a half cup. Cut the round side of the squash in half and scoop out the seeds with a spoon. Now cut the squash into fine half inch cubes. Now that your squash is cut up, you're gonna measure out a half a cup and set aside. Next, we're gonna measure out one and a half cups of water Bring water to a boil on medium-high heat. Add a half cup butternut squash. Boil the squash for three to five minutes or until squash is soft. Add a half cup oatmeal and turn the heat to low. Stir constantly for one minute. Stir in a quarter cup blue cornmeal. Add a quarter cup raisins and one tablespoon chia seeds. Mix everything well then cover and let steam for three to five minutes. Once the oatmeal is fluffy, turn off heat and serve warm. Thank you so much for joining me today. Enjoy.
Now it's time for the weekly challenge. The weekly challenge is optional, but we encourage everyone to give it a shot. So, what's a plant-based breakfast that you'd like to make this week? Here's some ideas. You can have old-fashioned oatmeal with cinnamon, whole grain toast with peanut butter, tofu scramble, and you can have fruit with non-sweetened plant-based yogurt. Remember, when you're making a goal, keep it simple, realistic, and measurable. Thank you for joining us for lesson one. I hope we all got a lot out of the program today. I encourage everyone to take full advantage of our weekly challenge and finding a plant-based breakfast you'd like to try. And I hope you all join us next week for lesson two, where we delve deeper into the root causes of diabetes. So see you next time. Okay, did anyone have any questions about anything we saw during that? Um, email me, darylyn.berryman2 at gtbindians.com, and we'll get them over to our registered dietitian, Jennifer Paul, and we'll get the answer to your question if I don't know it. And so that brings us to the challenge of the week, and that is to eat a plant-based breakfast. And I really want to encourage you each week to do the challenges. Um, especially this one. So uh, you have any ideas of what you want to eat for breakfast? Um, oatmeal, wild rice for breakfast, uh, any grains, whole grains you can think of. You can add any of those and treat them like oatmeal and use any grain uh, with uh, creamer, uh, non-dairy creamer and any fruit, dried fruits or nuts or fresh foods. Um, so what we want you to do is to uh, try this, at least three plant-based breakfasts this week. You could try five, you could try seven. Um, some like to set the low bar and then exceed it. Um, others like to set a goal that they'll be challenging but attainable. And uh, for more ideas about what to eat, check out the list of meal ideas in the handouts. So look for the handouts in the tab on the GTB website under the special diabetes area and you'll see the handout for this week and that has ideas in there. And there's also a native uh, power plate placemat that has extra ideas on there too. So um wanted to say try the challenge join us next week and thank you for coming today look over the program handouts and remember to complete that evaluation for that survey and to put Daryl Berryman as the instructor email me with your questions try to do the challenges and then join me and bring a friend next week show them this video get caught up so you can come next week six o'clock for the next now it's five more Tuesdays at six and um, we'll get off that, as they said earlier, that diabetes highway. All right, thank you so much for coming. See you next time. Bye-bye.